I, uh, I, th I think it's really important to talk about the definition, the working definition of the flipped classroom, because it's, it's not new. It's been around, I would say, for 15 years, for sure, maybe a little bit longer than that. And it has other names that it can be used, uh, blended learning, etc. cetera. Um, flipped learning is another term I've used or have seen used. And one of the things um, that I think it's, I'm gonna jump ahead. Um, one of the things I wanna talk about is what, what it is and what it isn't. And one of the things, when we talk about the flipped classroom, it's basically taking what you normally would do in the classroom in regard to teacher-directed learning and having students do that themselves. And it sounds really scary when you say it like that because it's student-led. So instead of you presenting a PowerPoint or a Google slideshow, they go through it. Or instead of lecturing directly to them, writing notes out, um, you would record yourself doing that. Or showing them a video, they go and watch the video at their own time, at their own pace, and at the, maybe they have to watch it two or three times. So the idea is the static instruction that happens within a regular classroom um, is now done on the student's own time. So that homework piece is now then moved over to the regular classroom. That's kind of entry-level flipping from my perspective. Not right or wrong, that's the entry-level where you're flipping those two important pieces. Why would you do that? Well, these are the four points that I've found and I, I, I think I do believe in. One would be reinforcement. We'll take um, maybe uh, a math class, for example. The teacher normally would teach a, a topic like uh, the addition of fractions. You would work on that, they would talk about that, uh, they would present that lesson. And then, obviously, homework is all about reinforcement and practice. Well, the challenge is they're doing that part of the whole learning experience without a teacher present. The teacher, they may have a parent who's a teacher, but generally they don't. And a lot of times, that's where the frustration piece uh, falls into, where that's when they most need your help, um, is when they're working on the project when they're working on the questions, when they're working on the exercises. So the benefit of the flipped classroom on that level, just gonna jump back here, is um, you get to be there when they're doing their assignments. Um, what are your thoughts on that, you guys? Does that make sense to everyone right now? Bit of silence, that's okay. I'll keep going. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, though, and I'll jump on back here real quick, is how do you do this now in this new digital world? Well, one of the things we can do is to find videos that teach the content that we need to teach, or better yet, you make your own videos. Um, how many people have made their own lecture so far. They've recorded a lesson, uh, a part of a lesson, some of a lesson. That would be kind of our first step. You would link that video, you would push it out using Google Classroom, and that's for another uh, presentation on how you actually do record your own lessons. Um, these, that's quite the flow this young man has, but students watch your lecture, absolutely fascinated, amazed, can't believe what they're learning, or the video that you sent them. And then you gotta make sure they actually watched it, that they actually read it, that they actually did it. And that's the homework side of things in our digital world. And I gotta be honest, I, I, it was hit and miss. Um, with my grade 11s and 12s. I primarily teach psychology, 
but I also teach design and business technology at Northeast Kings in the Annapolis Valley. And this is where things kind of broke for me, where I'm like, something really is, a, is kind of missing. So I thought it was important to figure out, what, once you make the lesson for your students, this, that's the heavy lifting, what do you do? Um, this is not necessarily flipping the classroom, but you're gonna flip the learning. As I've written here, now that you've got the content covered, and you're sure that most of your students have actually read it, saw it, done it, um, then their student-led learning can begin. The, this is the stage that I was at before, where maybe all you do when you see them in a Google Meet, if you do, if you do any synchronous learning, what you then can do is answer any questions or have them have office hours where you can be there to help them work through um, their questions that they have on the assignment or on particular questions. This is where Google Jamboard comes into play. As an example, there's other virtual whiteboards out there as well, where they can be showing or sharing their work to you, and this is the time that you can be providing real-time feedback, where they're sharing their screen, where they're sharing their Jamboard, as an example. The application piece is really where I spend a lot of my time with my students is once I taught them an idea or a concept and they've consumed that through my lecture or through the presentation that I've pushed out to them, they have to do an assignment. And I think that's where we can create further engagement for our students. The application a lot of times is you want to figure out how well do they know what you're talking about. I'm going to use a, an English example. If you're teaching a particular novel or a short story or a poem, you want to know that they understand that particular piece of literature. Well, the application or the assignment should go back to their ability to show an understanding of the themes, the ideas, the characterization, et cetera. That's where the application would work in. If it's a science class and you're teaching maybe a grade eight science class about viscosity and the idea of the thickness of liquid and they have to come up with a, a, a video which shows their uh, understanding of the concept of one liquid is faster than another and they have to videotape it and explain it. Well, that would be a great example of an application of the knowledge that they have gained. The enrichment piece and the exploration are almost good friends. That's where we flip it so the students can maybe do some project-based learning. They can learn more about a particular area that's a passion of theirs. And that's where we're at at this point. Um, how am I doing for pace, you guys? Is this too fast or are you, am, I, am I on pace for you guys? Okay, good. It seems I think it's all good. All right, sounds good. I, I was just being patient. All right, I'm going to come on back. Um, so here's where I came from um, when I was putting together this presentation. I thought about something like social media projects or what I call social projects. A lot of times, if we're going to do this distance or we're going to have some element of the flipped classroom, you need a hook. You need something that engages the student. And... I don't know if your students are like this, but some of them like their phones. They like social media. Um, so why not take some of the things that, I guess, hook people into using social media for the good of learning? So the example, and I, and this, this is full credit to Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook. He has created Google Slide templates, which I've linked in this presentation, um, to Snapchat games. I Full disclosure, I do not, uh, I've never used Snapchat, I've never downloaded it. Your students don't have to either. But most of them will be aware of it, they'll have used some form of it. The idea behind this is 
you, he has created templates in Google Slides, which they all have access to for learning purposes. So here's the example. Um, so I give credit to Matt at this one. He's, he's got a Google Teacher podcast, which I highly recommend if you get your into podcasts. But basically, as I said here, he's created a series of Google Slide templates that you can make copies of, customized for your subject, whether it be physics or French or healthy living or whatever the, the, the subject or grade level, and make it into your own, leveraging the popularity of the social media um, to fuel student engagement. So here's this example. Would you rather eat a steak dinner or have a seafood platter? That has nothing to do with um, education necessarily, but which character is more courageous? And they take a selfie and they point to one or the other, and then they explain their choice. Or what would be a better environmental choice? Electric vehicles versus hydrogen powered vehicles, as an example. And within this Google slideshow, I have a link directly to his um, um, uh, presentation. And what he does, I hope you can see this, I, I, I switched tabs. Um, he explains the rationale behind each of the, um, of the games. Now coming on back, he has uh, another game called My Face When, uh, using emotions. And these emotions could be about like political events, historical uh, time periods, uh, behaviors of characters, etc. And using the template, students, you push the template out. Once you customize it, you push the template out to the students and they customize it as a way of showing their learning. I wish I could see all your faces where you're saying, this is amazing, you're excited, uh, this is good. I'm assuming, I'll assume that you are. Um, hold on for a second, here we go. Um, here's another one that he has. Instagram is this another one. Uh, I don't use IG much. Um, Instagram stories and Facebook stories, I think they're owned by the same company now, but the idea is um, you harness the popularity of those to uh, students to show their learning, to show their understanding of a particular uh, uh, piece of information that they've learned or a topic that they have been researching. Uh, again, you don't need the Instagram app. You need Google Slides and there's the template there. I can't imagine that there are actually a billion users of Instagram, but apparently there are. So uh, that hopefully will be of some use to you as well. So he actually gave us some examples of uh, what he could, what he has his students use uh, Instagram stories for: historical figures, characters for a story, uh, replaying a science lab, demonstrating a skill. Um, I know um, one of my colleagues is a healthy living. Uh, a, what is it, fitness leadership, grade 11 and 12, and he had them doing, uh, showing workout videos, uh, trick shots of the day, different skills in terms of the sports that they play outside of school, etc. So these are all ways that students can uh, be engaged in what you're talking about, and, and by turning in the assignment, they're showing that engagement, but also it's a little bit more creative as well. Um, I don't know if there's any TikTokers out there, but Matt Miller also has a TikTok uh, with Google Slides, and uh, you can check that out as well, uh, where they actually create uh, a series of videos which have them on um, showing their uh, uh, their knowledge about something in particular. Adam, you you were saying that your some of your teachers in uh, your uh, school division. Uh, have really uh, tapped into the power of Flipgrid. Is that right? Yeah, I would say that that's it's certainly the most requested support tool in our in our region. Yeah, um, I recommend it. Would you fall into that category as well? You uh, recommend it? Yeah, I it's it's I, I I I would recommend it because it does it mimics certain features of like Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok. Yeah. Uh, but it's self-contained uh, educational space. And yeah. there's just, 
I mean, it's so simple to use, but there's 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 a thousand ways to innovate with it. So yeah, it's it's certainly it's the it's the tool that's excited me most beyond like when Google Classroom and Google Apps for Education was introduced. Yeah, I would I, I would I would really agree. I I try not to be a one app person, but I mean we're all trying to do the same thing here. We're trying to engage students. We're trying to uh, have an idea whether they're understanding what we've taught them. What the and they're, we're trying to give them the vehicle that they show they can show what they've learned. So I think at the end of it, that's one of the the values. Let me keep on going here. Um, I use this a lot. Uh, Facebook with Google Slides. Uh, I've mimicked, uh, I'm not sure which template I gave, but uh, I've mimicked what Facebook looks like in regard to uh, photos, groups, um, likes, um, conversations, the wall, etc. where, uh, as I said, I teach psychology and my students have created um, the Facebook wall of Carl Jung or um, uh, Carl Rogers or there's a lot of Carls in psychology I just realized, uh, Sigmund Freud, etc. And they can talk about their knowledge of those particular psychological thinkers by recreating a Facebook wall of, of their own. The value of using a template within something like Google Slides is one of security. They're not actually creating a Facebook account. They're filling in the um, uh, placeholders that I've, I've created for the Google Slides. Twitter is much the same. Um, 140 characters uh, for tweets doesn't seem like a lot. Um, I try not to be political here, but I said despite the efforts of some orange-faced political leaders, Twitter can actually be used to show knowledge. Um, the media platform is mimicked in Google Slides and students can uh, tweet out under the names of people like, uh, or real life people, or about issues, concepts, events, etc. cetera. Um, the musings of historical figures, their understandings of a spoken word poem, et cetera. Again, there, there's templates that I have linked within here. So at the end of it, as I put in here, is this is all about engaged learning. We, we really want to provide feedback to our students. One of the things that I have found, and I don't know if people feel the same about this, the best piece of, um, the best times that I've had uh, of success over the last couple of months with uh, the COVID learning, distance learning, flip learning, is having a chance to talk to my students. And whether it's in a small group or with my whole class, um, if you can almost leave, flip the learning to be student-directed, using the time of, within Google Meet just to check in. What's the part-time job like? How are things with your brothers and sisters? Uh, have you guys read that novel? Did you see that video that I sent out? And so, in a way, that was the piece I think a lot of our students were missing was the connection with their teachers. And so with the, um, uh, with the power of, of uh, digital learning, we can connect with something like Google Meet. And so when I talk about flipping the digital classroom, I also mean freeing up time for us just to talk and just to check in. And I don't think that can be uh, overstated in, in my personal opinion. So um, I wanted to talk to you about something called actively learn. I use this in the university course that I've taught in my grade 11 and 12 classes, but really it's a reading hub that could be used from grade 1 to 12. And it's a, you can get a free educator account. And what it basically allows you to do, I have some screenshots here. Um, I can grab articles off the web I can upload them to the dashboard and within, say, a three or four page short story, um, a longer poem or an article, I can put questions in there. So for example here, um, I have, I'm an English teacher historically and so I have a before, during, and after approach. So I'll ask them a question to prompt 
software learning. And what happens is, um, with this particular program, I can embed those questions right within the text. So before they begin reading, and they respond, and then begin the reading, and then during the reading, I can also put in open-ended questions, multiple choice, etc. And what I like about Actively Learn, it gives me a lot of data as well. And so I can see, I hope it's okay that I'm showing my students here, but I can, I can see uh, one of my top students, she only was involved in reading the article, which took me 10 minutes to read, and also answering all the questions. So that kind of tells me how long she was engaged in that particular piece of uh, uh, literature versus another student was uh, involved for 29 minutes. So it took a lot longer to go through the assignment. So the idea behind it is not only can you use actively learn to um, push reading out, adding questions, you can also mark each question uh, within it and push it back to the students so that they can get your feedback on what their answers were. Um, thoughts on that one? Uh, I hope you guys, uh, if you haven't used Actively Learn uh, already, it might be something you, you give a try to. Again, it's, a, it's free. Uh, there is a, obviously with most of these, there's a, a pro uh, version of it, but I find the free version is, is fine. <clears throat> um, good friends with uh, Actively Learn is the video version of this. I use this a lot. I don't know, I don't know if you've pushed this out to anyone before, but Edpuzzle is, um, is a pretty powerful one. Has anyone used Edpuzzle before? I've, I've played with it a bit. We have a few requests for it in our region, and it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a neat little, it's an assessment tool, right? Yeah. Well, basically how it works, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is um, you, you uh, upload or choose a video from their uh, interface. I think I have a link here. Um, I've uploaded a video from YouTube. This is from my grad class, actually, that I was teaching. Um, and within the video itself, this video happened to be about nine minutes long. I, I insert questions. And so as the students are watching, I, I question or I throw out a question about um, whatever it is I want to ask them about. And then those questions are all pushed to me in a, an equivalent of a Google form. And so the idea is uh, it is assessment, but it's also engagement. So students actually have to watch the whole video. They have to uh, you maybe get some thought to what it is you're trying to get them to get out of a particular resource. So Edpuzzle is another one that I would recommend. Um, questions on that one? Okay, I'm going to keep on rolling here, you guys. <clears throat> so how the Edpuzzle part works, though, is it actually allows me to also grade each of the questions as well out of whatever. I could make it out of just completion, out of one out of one, out of 10, out of 100, and then check that they've actually done. Um, Wakelet is, I would say, an educational version of Pinterest. Um, it's a place, as it says here, to save, organize, and share links and media um, into these ribbons or collections that you can share out with people. So. Uh, the idea is students can create their own wakelet with content that they may be using for a research project, or they can use it as a way of showing, maybe I want you to go find five articles on or videos on healthy living or healthy eating. And so that's their task. Or give me some examples of how um, self-driving cars have been developed over the years as an example. Um, but as I said, professionally, you can use this yourself as a way to uh, plan out units of study or of lessons, et cetera, or entire courses. So again, uh, Wakelet would be one that you could use to flip 
um, your classroom and your students could be working on their wakelet um, during your regular class time if we were still in class or this is something that they could produce as part of distance learning. Animoto uh, is another uh, application I would recommend. It's more of a multimedia presentation where it combines music and text and images wrapped up all together for students to be able to um, explore a topic, maybe do a research project on a particular country or culture or concept. And it's a drag and drop engine. It's free. It has lots of different themes. And uh, I think now you can collaborate with Animoto so more than one student could be working on this at the same time. Um, great minds think alike. As I was putting together this uh, presentation, um, um, Flipgrid was one that did come up. In, and if you haven't already uh, dug into it a little bit, um, it's user friendly. Students are getting far more comfortable using it. Uh, they can produce and collaborate and share. Um, and the app is pretty intuitive as well. So they can use their tablet or their Chromebook or their, um, their phone to um, produce assignments. And I think this might be the second last one, uh, Adobe Spark. I've used this a few times, and I think it's shockingly effective for um, the ability to create videos or multimedia presentations, the ability to create static infographics or posters, or to create a one-page website. And the good folks at Adobe uh, are kind enough to provide this for free as well. Um, the last one I have is Padlet. And Padlet is really one of those digital whiteboards as well, where I'm going to bring one of mine up so you get a, a real idea of what it could look like. Apparently, Padlet leaves were beautiful, which is nice. Bear with me as I get myself logged in here. And again, this is a lot easier to show. So these are all the, uh, the different um, tablets that I've created. And really, it's quite often creating a prompt. And so in this particular video, Adam, can everyone see this, do you think, as this tablet um, tab opened up? Uh, I just see the Padlet logo. Oh, um, just the, just the just the light bulb. Just light bulb. Okay. Um, let me come back in and reshare. Uh, I see. My bad. I um, I'll get to there now. Uh, how's that, you guys? Is that better? Can you? Yeah, I can see now. Okay, so this is an example of how I've used Padlet in the past. Um, these were three articles. So this is my consciousness unit from my psychology class. And what the students had to do was uh, actually read each article, and then um, we'll talk about they were supposed to put their names in. Most of them didn't, which is probably good for this presentation. But you'll notice it. I just scroll down, and I can see who has actually um, read each of the particular uh, articles which I assigned. And so this is a way not only can I see what they've read, but they can also um, read what their classmates have had to say as well. And so. I'll show you this with uh, an example of um, personality. So with, within these padlets, what you can be able to do is, I was just starting this one off, is I got them, you can post videos here. So they watched the video and responded to it. I got them to uh, have a look at this um, uh, 
I believe it was an infographic or a poster. And then they actually listened to a podcast here. And after listening to the podcast, they responded to it. So this was an example of where I was using, I was trying to uh, use a variety of different mediums to uh, teach a concept or introduce a concept. And this one happened to be personality. And students had to watch, look, and listen, and then give response to. And so with, um, uh, with Padlet, what's good about it, it, it allows you to uh, choose a format. So coming in here, the Padlet could be a traditional wall. I've actually started to use um, this shelf one quite a lot. And what it looks like is um, start posting here. It allows you to uh, create columns. And that's a way you can organize things. So maybe in this way, um, this is during a live class, you could have uh, assign a column to a group. So your group is, you know, you're jigsawing in a digital way a particular assignment. And what they put in there goes under that particular column. And within here, they can put every any sort of material in here. So maybe they wanted to uh, um, put in a link or an image. Um, so they can search for a video on education. Sounds pretty exciting. And the idea is that can um, uh, be added to a particular um, uh, column. And so you guys go find a, uh, a video, go find an image, go find an article and tell us about it. And then obviously by looking at the entire Padlet, the rest of the students can get an understanding of what uh, is being presented. I'm just going to come on back here. Apologies, I know that was a lot of information, uh, but uh, hopefully one or two things will work for you guys. So, um, yeah, that's it for the presentation.